Hello and welcome to the special broadcast, a documentary by Dan Sand Creatives. I'm Carl Crawford and I was invited by WDSE WRPT to moderate tonight's discussion. Joining me in studio are tonight's guests, Daniel and Sandra Oyenloye, whose documentary, I Can't Breathe, a Clayton Jackson McGee Memorial, premiered Monday, June 15th on Facebook. Daniel and Sandra approached WDSE about airing the documentary and the station agreed that it is an important voice from a community and will hopefully lead to an important conversation within this community. The documentary will be shown in two segments. We will watch the first segment, then talk with Daniel and Sandra about the production and how it came to be. We will then watch the second segment and talk about where we go from here. A quick note, the documentary contains graphic content and viewer discretion is advised. This is I Can't Breathe, a Clayton Jackson McGee Memorial. On the evening of June 15th, 1920, in Duluth, Minnesota, three black men wrongfully accused of raping a white woman were abducted from the Duluth, Minnesota city jail. The accusers, Irene Tuscan and Jimmy Sullivan, had attended a circus the night before which they claimed that six black men had robbed them at gunpoint and raped Irene Tuscan. Although a physician report found no evidence of rape, the couple stuck to their story and rumors spread quickly like wildfires. Resulting in a mob numbering between five and 10,000 people who broke into the jail on Superior Street and dragged three young men, Elias Clayton, Elmer Jackson, and Isaac McGee, to the corner of First Street and 2nd Avenue East. They savagely beat and tortured these three young men, then hung them from a lamppost in the middle of Duluth's downtown. The grim spectacle of the mob posing with the lynched man was then captured by a photographer and then circulated as a postcard. It was widely agreed to be the most heinous lynching of 1920. How you enslave in Christ's name? How you take kids from their family? How you got a legal game? How you got us thinking that we free and legalize, privatized prisons in Amendment 13? Good evening. Once again, cell phone video and the internet have made us all bystanders to the gritty and sometimes ugly side of police work. To the violent incident at a Louisiana middle school. First one officer, then two, appearing to body slam a 14-year-old. Cell phone video shows some of what happened next. A Newton County Sheriff's deputy who's assigned to the school as a resource officer ended up slamming the ninth grader to the floor. <laughs> Oh, my God. 
The school police officer body slamming a female high school student has triggered outrage in the North Carolina community. Now you can't handle my daughter. The officer takes her daughter down and she lunges towards them. Melissa McKinnis and family and supporters were outside the St. Louis County Justice Center to talk about the death of her son, 24-year-old Donye Dion Jones. The mother, a fiery Ferguson protester, has said she believes Donye was lynched. His body was found by family early on October 17th, hanging from a tree by a bedsheet in the backyard of his mom's North County home in the 11,400 block of Criterion. Lennon headed out for a walk the night of August 28th. They never saw him alive again the next morning. It's a black male subject. Hanging from the swing. Yeah. He's not yourself. Lennon's body was found dangling, covered in fire ants in the center of a mobile home park. Authorities have released body cam video of Derek Scott's arrest from May of last year. I can't breathe. Stop resisting. I can't breathe, please. Okay, I, give me your I hand. Can't breathe. I can't breathe. I don't care. That response of I don't care raising questions. Now to a deadly shooting that's inflamed racial tensions in a Georgia community. Tonight video has surfaced of an African American man being chased down and killed. His family says he was just out jogging. While he was jogging through this Brunswick, Georgia neighborhood in February, Arbery was confronted by Gregory McMichael and his son Travis who shot Arbery twice with a shotgun before the 25-year-old collapsed and died. Go ahead and take your seatbelt off for me. Go ahead and take your seatbelt off. Stop! Stop! Please don't shoot me. But why they shot the black boy and not the fat boy? You know, because they deal with the blacks. That looks like a bad dude, too. To be honest with you. Go pull it out! I believe she lives in Homecraft Court. Stand by. You are not. Stay back! Stay back! You see how he's driving my neck, right? Get the cuff off. Stop it! Get on the ground! Stay back! Put your hands behind your back! The rallies across this country, they are shouting another name as well. Brianna Taylor, who would have turned 27 today. Back in March, she was shot eight times while she slept in her bed in Louisville. The protesters across this country demanding, say her name. Here's Deborah Roberts. Tonight demands for justice as the FBI investigate Brianna Taylor's killing at the hands of police. Say her name. Today she would have turned 27. Lynch on streets, in cars, in jail, by the store, in the store, with our kids, without our kids, isolated, in public, with a statement, without a statement, on a walk, on a jog, on balconies, on our way to work or from work, going to school, coming from school, in our church, in our homes, in a park, as a child or an adult. We can't breathe. One hundred years later, June 15th, 2020, 
Black men and women are still being lynched in streets by an invisible mob of people hiding behind systems and policy. Eight minutes and 46 seconds that you were on the guy's neck and he, he was crying for his mama is telling you that he can't breathe and two others sitting on his chest, you know, also kneeling on his chest. He was already saying he couldn't breathe, so that should have been a sign right there, like just pick him up, put him in the car. They, people kept saying, telling him to get in the car, he couldn't even get up. There, there's so much anger uh, that, you know, the emotions that, that goes through it, it, it. The look on the officer's face with his hands in his pocket, no emotion. That says so much in that video said enough is enough when he was already i, I must say i'm gonna just say passed away when he was already passed passed away um a paramedics came to check his pulse he still had his knee on his neck and he wasn't even resisting none of that he been start resisting he been wanting to get up so i feel like that was wrong he was robbed his children and his family was robbed and it just to die in a violent way it's just a horrible way to go it's very sad and i'm angry just violence against black people around bodies in this country another black man another black body was taken from our community at the hands of police um, and each time it happens, just realizing the lack of respect and trying to understand how people can look at us, look at our bodies and not see the dignity that we have. And I get a lot of frustration behind it, especially with like my peers, because some of them find it as a joke and it's really frustrating because it's like, they don't understand how real it is because of white privilege, you know? It's not like they hear it from their other, from their family, like they don't share it, you know? Cause they've never have to worry about it. So it's kind of just frustrating. Um, I know that some people that I know have mixed feelings on it, but I think that it was wrong. When I see things like that happen, <laughs> It just makes me also very suspicious of um, what could potentially happen here and um, and how how is that going to affect the people that I care about who are very close here in, in, in Duluth. There are so, so many feelings going through me at that particular time, um, especially anger. I was angry, it, it was unfair of what happened to him, and I was just sad and mad. Anger, um, frustration. It's devastating. I feel like it's senseless and more of the same. I was I was pretty shocked when I saw, saw it. Like, I already know stuff is like this going on, but like, it's just like pretty shocking to me. It's hard to put it into words because it's um, something I've, I don't, me and a lot of other people have just felt our entire lives. It has happened and it continues to happen and it's going to continue to happen until we, we make some change. And so, you know, for me, there was a little bit of numbness too. Like, okay, um, I don't, I don't exactly know how to, processes or what to feel in this moment. Angry and betrayed by society. I feel like society's trying to abuse his death. We we'll go back to now the NFL saying, oh yeah, we were, we, we apologize for Kaepernick and, and, and this whole flag that he got for it's like, oh, well, duh. You know, they tried it, he tried it very peacefully, and you gave him fuck for that. There is nothing that we've been saying 
that, oh yeah, it's going to listen now. Well, now, now they're having to listen. This is not the way I would, I would, I would have liked for things to happen. But if this is what's going to make you listen, oh well. I didn't see just another man die or another black man die. It was as if I was watching my dad, uncle, or myself in that situation. It feels like they keep telling us that, you know, we're free, but we aren't. I think we just need to take what's ours and build up and remember him and everyone who's being killed right now to this day. The life of the dream ain't supposed to be limited by the life of the dreamer. And this is why I can still take pride in holding tight to this here dream. But it seems that we have all forgotten that our dreams must constantly fight to overcome reality. And our reality is somewhere between the truth and the bald-faced lie that racism has gone away. Because racism ain't gone nowhere. It simply now wears a disguise because we still got black folks getting victimized and brutalized by black hole mortgages and hurricanes named Katrina, and then in the end getting screwed over by the people over at FEMA, comma, assassinated on, by police on live streams, uh, comma, and this is all what they allow you to see. So I think the beast has been on his mission. The problem is that we have all been missing, misleading ourselves into Crayola colored denominations, hyphenated stakes to a nation in which our presence has gone from necessity to novelty. And now our existence persists upon the borders of citizen and resident alien. We've been alienated since our arrival, but we can't afford to return flight. We can't give praises to Martin and get on boats with Garvey at the same time because this right here is our fight. And it don't take a team of political analysts to tell me that the things that are going on couldn't have been an accident. It's been repeating itself for so dang long, it is far beyond redundant. And this is why I believe you see, I believe that it was seen in Martin's dreams that we were always going to have these hard times ahead. But it looks like since the Civil Rights Act and Affirmative Action, we done got too bougie instead to make revolutions anymore. We've got more problems than we got solutions. We can't feed the huddled masses, yet we still got billions for war. But maybe we done got everything that we've been fighting for, that Douglas Randolph King and Shabazz lived their lives for, justice, equality, and peace. But of all of these things, we have not seen the least. Instead, we have gotten empty legislatures to get overwritten by special interest policies, fiscally advantageous projects that keep black folks locked up in projects. And I'm telling you, these experiments ain't done yet. That's why we are still lacking our justice and we are searching for peace. And there is no equality when 13% of our population is 44% of its prisons and over 50% of those contracting immunodeficiencies. The disparities in American life is what punctuates this. The No Child Left Behind Act is what perpetuates this. So if wars are necessary in order for us to maintain this kind of peace, then we're going to stay out in these streets and we're going to fight the bull And this is why I get on poetic pulpits. And I'm going to continue to spit this in the hopes that we can one day find true peace. And once we do, we must bind it, inscribe our names upon it, and make it our own. Because a peace that is taken for granted can soon be gone. We have got to move on. We have got to get strong. Because we are. We are the children of ancestors that sweat blood with broken backs that built this nation. And they were always looking forward toward a future that we full of the hope that our present should have brought us. But we have squandered our gifts. We've been so busy leaning and rocking and no one's at home raising our children. And it's at that point the system wins. And we all gonna get done in if we don't learn to, if we don't yearn to change all our mental conditions. We must learn, know, write, read. We must kick, scream, and fight to be free. Meanwhile, Governor Tim Walz issued a proclamation for George Floyd calling on all Minnesotans to observe a moment of silence today at the start of Floyd's funeral for 8 minutes and 46 seconds. That's the amount of time a Minneapolis police officer was filmed with his knee to Floyd's neck before he died. One example of this moment of silence happened during a St. Louis County board meeting, and it was the same moment Commissioner Keith Nelson left the room. Tonight, his reason why and one commissioner's call on him and the rest of the board to do better. That threaten the dignity of our state's black communities, indigenous communities, and communities of color. 
that St. Louis County Administrator Kevin Gray reading Governor Walls' proclamation for George Floyd Tuesday before a moment of silence requested by Walls at 11 a.m. for eight minutes and 46 seconds. Just the, the eight minutes plus that we were there, I looked around the room a little bit and everyone was thinking it. What would it have been like to be in that position? It's 2020. There is no place in St. Louis County for racism. The governor's request came down during a recess during the county board meeting. Board members, could you please stay on? We have a proclamation from the governor. But just as the reading of the proclamation began, longtime commissioner Keith Nelson left, telling board chair Mike Jugovich his stomach was upset. I understand uh, with the timing probably wasn't the best, but he did not feel well and he does have uh, some health issues. Commissioner Nelson would miss the entire moment of silence and would return after the recess at 11.15 a.m. to continue with the rest of the board meeting, but without any mention of his absence during the moment of silence, which Board Vice Chair Beth Olson says is unacceptable during such unrest in the country. If there was a reason to be gone, um, then there would be even more of a reason to say why you were gone and um, or just to say that you were gone and that it was important that you should have been there. He had other chances to speak to this issue and to express his support and express his respect for Mr. Floyd's life. He did not take those opportunities. Commissioner Nelson tells Fox 21 he is diabetic, meant no disrespect, and would have participated in the moment of silence if he would have felt better at the time. I think Commissioner, Commissioner Olson is being judgmental. Um, and, and that has been a pattern that she's had uh, for the past uh, year, year and a half. There's nothing to clarify. I did nothing wrong, okay? There's nothing to clarify. I, you know, I've been told this a hundred times this afternoon. This situation in Minneapolis, um, what, a, what a travesty. And Commissioner Crone, if the people in my district had voted for slavery, and if the vast majority had, and I was representing them, the answer is yes, I would have voted for it. Because that's my job. My job is to represent the people in my district. It is not to impose upon them my will. That is called a totalitarian state. Last I saw, we still live in a democracy. Racism is like, racism is American pie in Duluth. Like, it's just, Every single step of the way, every place that you go to, people just, I don't know. It's like they're, it's their first nature and no one talks about it and no one really cares to change it. It looks like benign neglect. Racism in Duluth is covert. I think it's a thin veneer of this fakeness. And when it comes down to it, uh, they'll throw you under the bus but to your face, they're nice and polite because that's what you do in Minnesota. It's a fakey kind of niceness. And it's a kind of ignorance, but it's not acknowledged. So, yeah. Uh, like my mom said, it's a lot of, it's a lot of passive aggressivism. It's, it's not direct hatred. It's more of a like underlying ignorance. People that are causing the racism are just too scared to admit it, what they're doing. So it's like, they're trying to keep it in silence. As long as we don't. If we're not in the same spaces, nobody cares. You can be, you can be oppressed and not even know about it. It's that kind of like, secret intolerance towards you that's like, it's almost invisible, I guess. The funny thing is, is I know it's racist people down here. I just like, they just quiet. Like, they racist, but they just quiet. Like, they just try to hide it, but they know they're racist. We feel it, and sometimes I think that's even worse than what people experience in the South where it's covert. You know, when I've been in the South, where I mean, I grew up in Texas, and when I've been other places in the South and I've experienced, co you know, overt racism, well, there's something kind of comforting to that because at least I know it's there. Here, I have to fight so hard for people to understand that it's happening and to believe it. And then it's even harder to try to do something about it. And so to me, racism here is so frustrating. 
I think racism looks like a, a lot of different ways. I mean, even the concept of Duluth itself is obviously built on settlements and colonization. And so, um, you know, that history uh, and that legacy of colonization and, and white supremacy obviously manifests uh, how Duluth is shaped today. Duluth is... Duluth is a tough city to be in, uh, as not just as a, uh, a person of color, but a non-native to do it. Now, we've been here 20 years and I can't really say I'm from Duluth. I will, I will never be able to say I'm from Duluth. Whereas when I was growing up in Philadelphia, after a certain time, people would ask me, where are you from? I say, I'm from Philadelphia. Uh, even though if you want to hold the whole story, yes, I'm from Haiti, but, but then now I'm living in Philadelphia, so I'm, I feel like Philadelphia in Duluth never really feels like you can say you're from Duluth because it always feels like you are the outsider. And that has been something I, I just had to accept. I'm, as a mixed kid, I grew up mainly with my white side um, and my white mother who villainized my black side and would um, constantly say like horrible things. Like racial slurs being said to people or people in the South flying Confederate flags. But to me, most of my life, I've lived in a mostly white world in Northern Minnesota and racism hurts the most when it comes from your white friends or supposed friends who don't say something when those things happen, who make jokes, who are silent, who don't understand the pain that I'm going through that the black community is going through right now at this time, but for our whole lives, every little cut that happens to us, they don't understand it and they refuse in their privilege to take one second to put their attempt to put themselves in our place. I was taught to stay away from people with darker skin. I was taught that They were dangerous. Which really sucks because that was that was my dad. Um, it was my friends. Is it, it was learning to cross the street, and now. Having to unlearn all those things, having to really dig deep into what I was taught and unlearn that and figure out who I am and what like that side of me represents. Um, you know, it has been a city that, that values whiteness, Eurocentricity, white supremacy and racism, which again has shaped you know, the, the current realities that is Duluth. And so I think racism looks a lot of different ways. I think it looks like, you know, opportunity gaps. It looks like a curriculum that centers and values whiteness uh, and productivity and capital over like human connection and learning and growth, um, you know, and building up of, of a community. Uh, I think racism looks like, you know, minimal organizations or businesses that are guided and, and sort of controlled by the power of, of black and indigenous folks in this community. Um, racism looks like the denial of racism and the realities of people of color in this city. Um, it looks like higher unemployment rates. Um, you know, it looks like all sorts of, of, of different things. And I think most folks of color in the city know exactly what it looks like and what it feels like. And we've experienced it in all sorts of different ways, depending on where we live in the city and who we interact with and what our jobs are. And, and all that sort of stuff. So it looks a lot of different ways, but it's very present. Duluth is a tough city for, for anyone who is not 
white. <laughs> so when you put the word Duluth and racism together, it reminds me of the event that happened in 1920 when three African-American circus workers were falsely accused of rape. And they were brought uh, to jail or in custody. But the Duluth residents were able to break them out. And that shows so much what Duluth was and it still is for people of color. Unfortunately, a symbol of the black experience in America. It's we extremely can't... important. It's something that they really don't talk about. They really don't teach us. I barely knew about it growing up, um, which sucks because it happened right here. Like we have a whole memorial about it and they just, they don't talk about it in schools. They like to pretend that it didn't happen, that it doesn't exist. It's important and everyone should know and everyone should know their names. It's very important because otherwise I think it'd just be swept under the rug like a lot of other things. Um, just like a, any kind of injustice. If, it, makes, it makes people uncomfortable and you have to be uncomfortable sometimes to think objectively and for real. And I think everybody needs to see that. Like, that's, a, that's, a, that's murder. That's horrible. And it happened and you can't ignore it because it was, it was so horrible. It happened in our own city, like right over there, and 10,000 people, right? Am I right? 10,000 people showed up for one person? One of the two. And it, it was just horrible. I feel like people should remember it. It's because they, they were innocent people that didn't do anything wrong. And they were like, got accused for something they didn't do at all. And it was like wrong for the people that did that because they just felt like they had a right to just like take their rights away. I think it's important to constantly remind people, black, white, and everything in between of the atrocities that have been, that have occurred here in Duluth and, and here in the United States. Because if three men can get dragged out onto the street and die in the open with hundreds of people looking, the least you can do is remember them. That's the least you can do. You need to recognize that the lynching that happened was wrong and racist, and not to forget the men that died for not doing something wrong today. And I think it just helps us to be humbled and to know where we came from and to know where we're going, and that the fight, it's, it's an everyday struggle. And that is why we fight. We look to the memorial as honoring the people who have died, um, but also hopeful for the future that we can walk away from that legacy. It speaks a lot to Duluth as a city and who we are today and how black people are still treated to this day in this city, in this town. And we can't ever let that go silent as it did for 70 years. It tells us that uh, we as a community, we as a culture, the white folks in the culture, they, they need to do better. Like Clayton, Jackson, McGee, they were lynched a hundred years ago. And the same thing just happened uh, a few days ago, a few weeks ago to George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and many more that have been happening like since 2000 and that's just 
not supposed to happen like a hundred years ago you should have learned like 30 years after that that it's not an it, this is not what we do this is not how humans live and they should have changed it right away because it's really sad that it's happening now and it's a very great injustice to the black folks who built this country and the people and how they continue living in it because that's what we're fighting for now and we'll be fighting forever if we don't do anything about it i think this generation is the only hope for the next generation well because i think it symbolizes how Everybody says there's gonna be change or it's gonna be different this time and it never really is. You know, like every time a person of color is killed because of their color from the police officers, they always say, we're working to fix the system. But then you come back and the same thing happens every year. It's one thing to see the memorial and then think about like how far we've come as a society. And something in that podcast said like, Afrofuturism is right now because you know, 50, 100 years ago, they could not have imagined the way things are right now and how they, they've improved, you know, things have improved. Um, but yet there's that, you know, also that contradiction that, or I don't know if not necessarily that's the right word, but this, the other side of that is that black and brown people are still getting killed. They may not be strung up, you know, at, at the lamppost, but they're being, you know, smashed on the streets and uh you know and killed it's so it, it's still happening and so it, it's really confusing that we have something there to remind us that we're better that we've come so far but then that's some that's a message i think for some people but then i think for people like me and then my black friends it's something completely different because it's a reminder that that can still happen right now. It's a ha it's a reminder that we're not safe walking and living being brown and black. And so it's not just one thing that I think about. It's many things that I think about and I feel about when I see the CJ and the memorial. <laughs> well, it's kind of sad because it's like this has happened before. Like the same thing happened years ago and it's still happening and I just don't get why. Yeah, you know, I, I, I've always had mixed feelings about the memorial. I think it's important to, to acknowledge and honor those three men. I think it's important to name that history. Um, you know, I think it's important to, to remember these things. Um, you know, for eternity, to continue to pass that knowledge to people and pass that information to people. But if you go into the memorial and you actually walk through the memorial, there really isn't any sort of conversation about racism or white supremacy, which is sort of the roots of what caused that in the first place. And so you could essentially walk through the memorial as a racist and chalk it up to, well, a group of people made bad decisions. And really it's so much more than that. It's so much deeper than that. And so the memorial never really hits what it needs to hit, which is this these core elements of racism and white supremacy and control and violence, right? And so, um, you know, that is a, a, a failing on our part as a community to, to, as a whole community, to really acknowledge what's going on. Um, and, and I think there, there needs to be more beyond a memorial, you know, history centers, cultural centers, interpretive centers in this space that are run, owned, guided, staffed, and worked by black people in this city. Um, who can talk more about what that memorial means and what the implications of, of this lynch, these lynchings mean then and now. Um, and so I, I have mixed feelings. I think it, it really can be a tool that we use as a community to educate. Uh, but I also think it's a, it can be a thing that white folks, city officials or white folks in the community use as sort of the collective apology, even though it hasn't really changed the experiences of black people in this city. And so it's great that that memorial exists, but you know, the ultimate memorial to victims of lynchings are, are, you know, cultural change, systemic change, change that can't allow those realities to exist any longer. This little light of mine, this little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine, I'm gonna let it shine, let it shine, 
let it shine. Heaven only knows, heaven only knows the places I will go, the distance I will go. Let it shine, let it shine. This little light of mine, this little light of mine. I'm gonna let it shine I'm gonna let it shine Let it shine Let it shine Heaven only knows Heaven only knows The places I will go The distance I will go Let it shine Let it shine you gotta be us sometimes. You should speak up sometimes. You use your voice sometimes. Let it come. You gotta be heard sometimes. You should speak up sometimes. Use your voice sometimes. Let it come. I just can't let nothing take. Over me, I just can't let nothing control me. I just can't let nothing take my feelings away. You gotta I just can't let nothing take over me. I just can't let nothing control me. I just can't let nothing take my feelings away. You gotta be us sometimes. You should speak up. Use your voice sometimes Let it count You gotta be heard sometimes You should speak up sometimes Use your voice sometimes Let it count The clock strikes a quarter to midnight our minds high from a night of poetry in the big city. We prance down the way of the free, unaware that our golden carriage is a ratty pumpkin in the eyes of the blue. 68 in a 55, on my tail at 65, and in a bout of fatigue, I slipped to 68. I'm the only one who can drive this car, and I already drove six hours today. My kids had a poetry slam a few hours south, because there are not as many opportunities here, and you snicker as if spilling one's guts out on a stage is funny to you. Telling one's story is just a jolly old good time. As if being heard doesn't matter in your society. I'm glad that you grew up in a world where people listened. I'm glad you felt heard and appreciated and respected. Some people don't get that luxury. In a car stocked full of minorities, you snigger at us. Surveying the scene, your pressing gloves make a move, one on guard, the other on your gun. Your navy cloud starts pouring, rocking the boat, I'm seasick. Fighting the uprising of my dinner, still trying to digest the night. This is red, white, and bullshit, but worth your punching bag for the evening. Jab, your condescending chuckle, jab, the grain in your voice as you dab salt in our systemic wound, uppercut. Blaming the black man for the white man's immorality. You pin us down. More than ten seconds pass. Your hands hold our breath. You release your grip out of boredom. 68 in a 55, on my tail at 65, and leave us with the ticket of your baggage to limp back home in our ratty old pumpkin. I've committed to not sitting still. I've committed my life to trying to be a voice when necessary. I'm committing myself into telling stories in clothing. Or a body when necessary. I guess committing my life to equality 
into social justice. A generator of ideas when necessary to address the issue of, of racism and white supremacy. I've committed my life to knowing what's right and wrong. Educate. Um, educate, educate, educate. Um, I just want to keep trying to be for my people. I really have a passion for human dignity and revealing that. Um, and, and one of the things that's at the core of, of my beliefs is abolition. You know, abolition of police, abolition of prison, and, and creating an environment where we as people are free and that there actually is no systematized, systemic violence. African child to African parents who really don't understand the struggle that the, the black folks went through to, to bring this country up because we came here voluntarily voluntarily so they don't understand the struggle that the black folks put in before and my work is just to educate them and it's really hard but it's always giving them the reminder that you can do better and black folks are our allies because we're black and that's what we identify as first in America. And as a black woman um, in the United States, racial justice is something that I have to fight for. Um, I think morality and ethics are very important. And I just really, it sounds corny, I just want to really do the right thing. And that's what I committed my life to doing. My focus is the next generation. Um, I think it's too late for the people my age. Ah, it's too late. But the next generation, I can do something about that. I want to be an actor. When I was younger, I wanted to be a teacher. But now I just want to be like the owner of like a homeless shelter or something, because it's like a couple of homeless people out here. Well, I'm only 14, so I haven't really done a lot. But um, I have tried to protest, but sometimes it can get too rioty, you know what I mean? And I totally understand that, you know what I mean? Like, if the police are using force, you use force too. Like, I understand that, but as a 14-year-old girl, you know what I mean? It's just kind of hard. When I was younger, I was just saying anything. Like, when they asked me what I want to do, I just kept saying random stuff. But since I'm like, now I just know I just want to do hair and make money, that's it. I want to do something with law. I don't know, I feel like I can make a difference. And I want to be out there. I don't want to hide myself. As I, as I always, when I was little, I always said I wanted to be a doctor. As I was growing up, I said I wanted to be a nurse. And still, as of now, I still want to be a nurse, but I also want to be an entrepreneur. I'm only 19, but um, so far what I've been trying to do is I've been living up to my mother's expectations, my grandma's expectations, and my great-great-grandma's expectations, because they had to sacrifice a lot to get me to where I am today, and everything they have sacrificed and done has led up to me, and I'm just trying to live up to that. Ready? My name is Rudy Perel. Carla Hamilton. My name is Abdul. Jordan Moses, and that's Jordan with an O, J-O-R-D-O-N. Pearl Swanson. My name is Chris Davila. Glenn Simmons Jr. Hi, I'm Chloe Piper. I'm Q. Uh, my name is Emmanuel. I'm Ruby. My name is Teresa Pomboca. I'm Ruth Cabrera. My name is Cameron McGee. Leticia Houston. My name is Leticia Houston. I'm Abby Delisle. I'm Courtney. <laughs> I'm 14. I'm 19. Age 59. 20 years old. I'm 14. I'm 21. I'm 14. I'm 14. 36. 23 years old. Uh, I'm 44 years old. I'm 29 years old. I am 19 years old. I am 20 years old. University of Minnesota Medical School. I go to the University of Minnesota Duluth. University of Minnesota. Uh, I go to UMD and I work for the NAACP. I'm a member of the NAACP. In various chairs in the Black Student Association. And I play basketball. And I'm going to East High School this year. I'm going to East High School. I am from St. Paul, Minnesota, born in Ethiopia. Here in Duluth, we also have the Kaiba Foundation. I was the coordinator for the um, Clayton Jackson McGee Memorial Incorporated 100 year commemoration. I no longer serve in that capacity. Worked at St. Scholastica up until recently in the Diversity and Inclusion Office. Motivated community member.
if you're doing nothing, we're actually moving backwards. Joining us now is Daniel and Sandra Oyen Loye. Daniel and Sandra, thank you for coming on tonight's show. Why did you decide to make this film? So in thinking about this production, it was extremely important. That's the short answer. Um, the longer answer is there were a lot of moving parts going on at the same time. Mm -hmm. And um, this was um, the platform in which we, we were allowed to respond to everything going on. Um, we were contacted by Clayton Jackson McGee Memorial Board uh, to help with uh, bringing the, the event for this year um, to fruition uh, because the COVID-19 hit and all of the 2020 plans of Brian Stevenson that Jordan Moses is putting all the hard work in doing yes. um, fell apart uh, in terms of just for this year. Um, and we were called to see if there was anything we could do to help make that happen. And um, the way we work at Dance and Creatives is um, we, we are cons constantly thinking storytelling. And we're constantly mm -hmm. thinking how can we tell stories that relate especially to the black community um, in terms of voicing our voice as a people collectively. Um, and so a lot of the work we've done has revolved around that in our time. And so when this question came up, we were looking at what role do we play to respond um, in terms of just helping curate the, the narrative around Clayton Jackson McGee. That was before George Floyd mm. was killed yes. and murdered in cold blood. Um, and when that happened, we called the board up in the meeting and said, um, it's extremely important that we tell a story that frames things from the perspective of the history of lynching and murder and killing and white supremacy here in the United States. Um, and so Clayton Jackson McGee's story became sort of a, a catalyst or a framework to tell the stories of all the other names and people who have fallen victim to white supremacy and um, the injustice around um, policing in the United States. So um, Clayton Jackson McGee agreed to um, fund the project and make it happen. Um, we again, as dance and creatives operate as a community. So we mm -hmm. called all of our friends and community members, musicians and folks and poets and um, just community and asked questions of how to kind of go about it. And we got good advice from Blackbird Revolt, from yes. Jeremy Gardner, from you know, Natasha Lancor and all of our mm -hmm. uh, kind of community of folks of um, how to approach this, this subject. And so we decided to do an event to curate stories. Mm -hmm. um, I think answering that question for me is thinking about how have our stories been told in the yes. past. Our stories haven't oftentimes been told in a way that is curated by us, which is why I'm inspired by people like Eva DuVernay and you know, folks who continue to hold on to our stories and curate our stories in a very real way. It's not sugar-coated, it's not, it's not censored, it's not, um, it's not told in a way to please uh, white bodies or white people. Uh, yes. It's told in a very clear way of how we feel, how we experience it, and what is important to be noted. Um, and so that's why we felt it was important to respond uh, in kind through storytelling, through a film. Um, and we had, Duluth has currently a lot of talented folks who are uh, creating components for the film. I, we yes. didn't just make the film alone. Uh, it's impossible to make what, what we made in the short time we did. Uh, we made it because we had a lot of creative talent, black talent here in town, who were willing to put in overnights and time to create content to really bring this emotion to the screen. Sandra, if I can, how important is it that black people tell the narrative of the story of what happened on June 15th? Wow, um, I find it extremely important. Um, I think historically, you know, Daniel shed, shed some light on it, we haven't mm -hmm. told our stories, yes. right? Um, a lot of what is out there has been stories from, from an outside perspective. Um, and that narrative um, has often been, you know, created in a way that doesn't really get the full essence of who we are um, or the essence of how we, we, how we feel or, or what we're really dealing with and what we're going through. Um, I think that, you know, using this documentary to be able to collect community voice was um, was the best part of it, you know? Mm -hmm. um, just to kind of add on to wh how the documentary came about. So there is a segment of the documentary that is from an intergenerational um, yes. conversation, right? And, you know, just 
just having that, right? Having community members who are from the Duluth um, community sit down and, and talk about, you know, the current issues, right? And you yes. see how, you see that thread of how um, all is connected, mm -hmm. right? And you see the similarities in the stories, even though you're speaking to a completely different generation, right? Mm -hmm. and, and those are the stories that need to be told, right? Um, as we're progressing, as we're, we're, we're figuring out how to, to um, exist and, and be um, ourselves in this community, um, I find it also important that we're telling these stories because like I said, oftentimes that thread is there. And in terms of what we discuss in the documentary, what happened in your generation yes. should not be what's happening in, in my nine month old child's generation, Absolutely. right? Um, we, should, we should have progressed. So, so just being able to see that narrative and see how, um, how those things persist, I think is, is part of the reason why that's very important. Yes, I think what happened in Minnesota, we went from the land of 10,000 lakes to the land of 10 million tears mm. to 100 years later. And as you mentioned, the world was stopped by the death of George Floyd. The timeliness of being able to change and share the narrative. What did that mean for you both as creators, as artists in this moment? Yeah, like Sandra mentioned, I've always wrestled with this phrase or the frame of timeliness, especially in the context of America. Um, because when things happen, we always think of how things are timely, you know, and it's always a struggle because um, just from a lot of my reading, a lot of my study, a lot of my experience since here in the United States, um, it's, it just feels like something that seems to be timely um, doesn't, is not the same experience for mm -hmm. us black folks. Yes. Because for us, it's like, that's, that stuff happened last week. <laughs> like, really? like, that's the... Isn't that what happened to this person's friend or this person's mom or this person's father? And it's like those so sort of experiences feel like we're mm -hmm. always responding to talk about how things now are, you know, better um, and, and how things are isolated. Like George Floyd's death could be an isolated incident and different from Breonna Taylor or different from this. And it's like, oh, it's chokehold. If we ban the chokehold, yes. everything is fine. Um, if, oh no, it's because it's guns. Okay, so let's, let's take the guns and maybe we'll solve that entirely. Mm -hmm. I think we're not talking about the underlying issues. Mm -hmm. And I think that in the response of this documentary is having us look at, okay, there is, there is, there's a lot of issues. Mm -hmm. We yes. do have a lot of policy th changes that need to be made. Mm -hmm. uh, we, do, we do need to put, pursue a political system that may work for us, right? Um, but the concept is let's look at us. Let's look at white supremacy. Mm -hmm. Let's look at Clayton Jackson McGee. Mm -hmm. Let's look at 1920, 100 years ago, like you mentioned. Let's look at why um, 10,000 people would drag three black bodies from a jail and beat them to half dead and then post postcards yes. as a way of sending a message around the United States, kind of the culture of lynching around the United States. Let's look at all the 4,000 people we, we, we kind of documented that we hung. Let's look at the 2,000 more we just found out in a few months ago um, of people that were hung. And we cannot say it's a timely thing. We have to come to confront the idea that what's going on right now is an issue that is embedded into the education, the hearts of people. And to face that, yes. I think a film is a good start to some point because it is, um, a, I think the essence of stories for me is we, we continue to try and retell a story to touch the heart. But mm -hmm. what's practical also is that um, People who are white need to begin to challenge other white folks mm. about what they always thought was timely, what they always thought was isolated, and begin to have a bigger conversation as what has always been going on, what haven't we seen, why haven't we drawn the lines and the parallels between all of these stories, which is why we designed a documentary in that form of just showing back to back to back to back mm. without letting people breathe for a little bit in the yes. beginning of the documentary to say, look, I could do another three hour special on this because we still have a lot of footage that I couldn't put into that. Mm -hmm. But I had to create something somewhat gripping enough for that. So is there an idea for another opportunity to, <laughs> to have make, a sequel? <laughs> to make this production, I mean, a, to make anything film yes. costs money. And not just money, but time and energy. And not just time and energy, but the community of people. 
that's what it practically takes to make a production. We're here on set right now. Yes. We have people behind the camera. There's folks in the boot. Uh, that's often what isn't seen when people watch movies is mm -hmm. it takes millions, of, sometimes, of people or thousands of people to curate a story that is very impactful. So we are always willing to make movies. That's not a problem. Um, the question is, if these stories are important, then resources has to open up for folks, not just us. There's a lot of storytellers out there who are willing to tell stories like this for folks to begin to be empowered to tell those stories. Excellent. Sandra, if I can ask you, what surprised you the most about making this documentary? <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> <laughs> um, gosh, I don't, I don't think I was surprised by anything. In the, in at least, the, I, do, mm -hmm. are you referring to the content of the documentary? Yes, the content, the outpouring of community, the stories, the many stories and the common links as Daniel spoke about connecting the dots. I don't think that I was surprised by, um, by the narratives or the way the community came together. Mm -hmm. um, I think that, you know, in the line of work that I do, I've worked with young people in this community. Yes. I've worked in the elementary school, Lester Park. I've worked at you know, Denfeld, um, Lincoln Park, mm -hmm. um, middle school. And um, when you're working with our black youth, mm -hmm. right, um, these, these are the stories that yes. you hear, right? And when I'm hanging out with my black friends, mm -hmm. you know, these are the stories that I hear, yes. right? And when I'm hanging out with my black elders in the community, um, these are the stories that you hear, mm -hmm. you know? So it, it wasn't anything in the documentary as far as content wise that was, um, that was surprising mm -hmm. to me or, yeah. Good. Well, it's magnificent work. Mm -hmm. And we know that there's a cost to people telling and sharing their stories. Absolutely. And I'm sure this is gonna create great content. Mm -hmm. So where should those conversations be held? Pardon? Where should those conversations be held? Should they be held at home, everywhere. at work? Everywhere. everywhere. I yeah. feel like these are not, these should like, well, just like the stories, they shouldn't be isolated conversations. Yes. Uh, the incidents aren't isolated. And that's one of the biggest thing we wanted to address with this is this is not isolated. This is yes. not a one-time thing. So why should the conversations be? Why shouldn't we be in, at work at, um, in the market? selling goods and talking about racial divides? Why shouldn't we be talking about why there's a product for black women and black girls locked up in the, behind the shelf? Mm -hmm. So why can't we have the conversation at Target? Why can't we have the conversations at the store? Why can't we have the conversations at the oil companies in Africa that are taking resources from the communities and not giving back to those communities? Mm -hmm. Why can't we have the conversations in the police stations, um, reforming the police stations? So if someone is brought in under a useless charge, why isn't other officers talking about it in the stations and say that's that's bogus there's no reason why this person should be here there's no reason why you should detain this person here for so long with no charges with nothing that makes sense mm -hmm. so i think that the story has to be had or the conversation has to be had everywhere yes. um, and the fact that we would even think to limit it mm -hmm. or to think that there's a space for it that's why superi superiority that's why supremacy to me because mm -hmm. creating specific spaces to yes. deal with specific issues that address, that, that is something that everybody feels or everyone experiences that shapes society as a whole. I think that's, a, I won't say skillful way, I would say it's a tricky way to deal with things. It's a tricky way of gaining political points. It's a tricky way of being able to get more votes and redirecting conversation. Because if you could compartmentalize the things that matter to people, you could run anything. Yes. That's the issue with storytelling. That's why as storytellers, knowing that, we have to be able to challenge that by saying, this is a story for everyone. So if we have a power to create a space, we'll make sure that space could model that behavior that we have. We, we don't mm -hmm. own all the spaces. Uh, in fact, that's part of the issue is when, when folks came from Europe to this country with the indigenous community, they pushed folks all the way west. And that's the history of America. They took over spaces, they changed the culture of farming and hunting. They called it a civility contract that they gave the Cherokee people. These are the facts of how the country was built, is mm -hmm. they, they coordinated how spaces should be used and how people should put their kids and families in spaces, that was including schools. Mm -hmm. When they came to Africa, the same thing. They brought in certain aspects of what they call religion, which was co-opted already by Roman rule, if you ask me, mm -hmm. and they, they, they said that these are the spaces to have this kind of conversations. 
These are heavy things to discuss. Mm -hmm. We shouldn't be in 2020 and nobody has mentioned this and had conversations like this in public. Mm -hmm. Yes, there are repercussions for talking about things like this and that's one thing the community needs to know too is it's one thing for us to be vulnerable enough to come here and it's one thing for us to speak on these issues but we should be aware that we have to as a community protect each other mm -hmm. in all of this. Thank you both for sharing those words. We still have about 20 minutes left in the documentary. Daniel and Sandra, there is anything you'd like to say or set up what we'll be seeing next? The next part of this documentary is something that is, um, it's very personal. Um, a group of intergenerational African-American folks in Duluth came together to have a conversation. Mm -hmm. um, these are one of the conversations I personally as a filmmaker usually don't like to air because I think as African Americans we should be able to have spaces to discuss our own issues. Um, but this was also a conversation that everyone who participated wanted to air. They, wanted, mm -hmm. they understood that it was important for people to know what's going on. Yes. Um, so I think watching this segment mm -hmm. will be something that is giving perspective to the broader audience to see how we deal with our issues and how we deal with not just our issues but challenge folks in the community uh, to begin to see us and to see our need. So as you watch it, I hope you have that in mind. Excellent. Here's the second segment of I Can't Breathe, the Clayton Jackson McGee Memorial. We are the people. We are protectors. We are the storytellers, movement makers, a wave of justice. We are truth. We are the victims, we are the perpetrators. We are tied together because we are the carriers. Okay, my name is Shaquana McIntyre. Sebastian with a spoon. My name is Cameron Peake. I'm Delayla. My name is Deshaya. My name is Quay. My name is Tony. Tony Thorstead. My name is Kim Young. My name is, is Dudley Edmondson. I am 67 years old. 44. 39. I'm 32. I'm 17. I'm 16. I'm 15 years old. I'm 58 years of age. I've been in Duluth, Minnesota since I was six years old. I've been in Duluth for roughly over six years. 26 years now, I've been a Duluth resident. I've come and gone, but I've always came back to Duluth. It's since a sort of family here for me. I was born in Gary, Indiana. And I've been here for child way too long and I moved here when I was seven um, I, I've been going back and forth but I've been here since I was about roughly six years old I've been in Duluth um, 50 years I have been in this community and I mean both sides of the bridge since 1988 I've lived in this community for I think about 30 years I think that's about 34 years I'm not sure 32, somewhere around there now. I am native to Duluth, born and raised, uh, but I did leave uh, 10 years ago to move down to the, the Twin Cities area. I'm gonna start by introducing myself. So, I'm Daniel Luashe Yoyinloye. I came here about 15 years ago. So I come into this conversation more as a spectator, was curious to learn how you've adapted in this space, Duluth, to pull through all your perspectives, to learn what the space has to offer um, individually for you, but also as a collective, as a people, um, as black people. I was told it was started after the Clayton Jackson McGee Memorial, I mean after the hanging. And so they decided they needed to form an NAACP in Duluth. It was an event in Duluth. I don't remember the exact event. I just know um, that three men were falsely accused of raping a white woman. They were arrested that night. And from jail, people came and got them. And they were drugged from the jail cells of um, then the Duluth police station was somewhere on Superior Street. Beat them half deaf and lynched them. And with an audience of nearly 10,000 people. As far as for the lynchings for me, when I did realize what took place here, it did affect me. 
I know how it affects me every time I see like like people in their 90s that live here. I don't know, I just look at them weird. I feel like it makes the city kind of look like a bad place. Mm -hmm. And also like it kind of makes people of non-color look at us people of color different. Cause like y'all did that, y'all okay with it. Nobody did nothing to change it. Nobody brought light to it, but the, the three men downtown, but that's like just a reminder of how gross Duluth is to me. For African-Americans and people of color, it's, it's something that, you know, we pay attention to, but I don't feel like the white community as a whole really cares, to be brutally honest. It's something that maybe they pay attention to because, um, you know, they feel they're supposed to, but they really don't have a frame of reference. They may consider themselves not racist, not anti whatever and so for them to them it's it's an issue between black people and racist white people and they don't see themselves as either the NAACP that name sounds familiar hold on what is it uh, it's a also a bit of a, a resource where you can go and um, you know get information uh, get help I remember when there was a really strong relationship between the Twin Cities and Duluth, and they would come up and help and be supportive. There was also a time when we traveled to different NAACPs just to listen to what their leaders were saying and what they were doing in the community. And things changed like things normally do, and I just fell away from the NAACP. But when I first came here, that was a place to go, talk to individuals, find out what you needed. And they were also a very strong advocate for going with you, not only giving you the information you needed. Just being a black American in Duluth, Minnesota in and of itself, how, how challenging that is, how much you have to really fight to be seen, to be heard. Um, the way that I would describe my journey has been one of a, an awakening. Whiteness becomes pervasive um, as a consciousness, and then you just, it becomes you. And then as you get older, you start to see some differences that are happening and that are shaping the way we show up in the world. And I know what the trick is, because we love to drink the Kool-Aid, and that's what happens in Duluth, and that's why I left Duluth. Because Duluth in and of itself is very oppressive. Uh, we talked about this earlier in our group. Unless you have a college degree, there is no advance. And even having a college degree doesn't guarantee advancement in Duluth, Minnesota. And, I, and if I had my brother Stephen here, I, he could attest to that. He almost has a master's degree. He has to fight for every basic job he gets. And he's one of the smartest people I know. A very subtle change from when this child was in elementary school, and top of the class and popular and, you know, and then she got into junior high school and realized she was black. The school's fighting against you to a point. I actually switched schools and kind of just did independent learning. So I went to Denfield and um, that school just is just, it's, it's not good at all. But more of they're trying to teach you like a lesson you don't need to be harder for no reason. Up here, it's just, I don't care, do you work, do you work, do you work, do you work. And then it's like, they stereotype everybody, which is so annoying to me. Like, we still stereotype to this day. They think of us more like bad people, not too much of the quiet ones were always loud or just always doing something illegal. And it's not really like that. Although our children in elementary school, they know they're black. You don't know you black until you hit the upper levels. 26 years as a resident, okay? I've been able to see how they've pushed one race all to one side, up to a certain side of a city. And it's not until you get into that space, it's not until I got into that space that I seen the poverty and the mental illness and the addiction and experience some of myself. I wasn't good enough, I wasn't pretty enough, I didn't have the right hair, I didn't fit into the group, you know, for the, for the black folks, I was too white. Yep. For the white folks, I was too black. And so I isolated myself 
and I became extremely depressed. I have four kids, and out of my four kids, three are biracial, right? And so dating white women is still a massive struggle for me. The biggest part of my journey was finding myself beautiful. It's being heard by the people that need to hear me. I have a fear of either I'm not going to be understood or either I'm not going to be heard. So what they did to me out there, I turned it on my own self. Every day it's, it's, a, it's a journey, it's a fight to continue to push forward, to continue to move on. There's been times where I just felt like giving up to the point where it's just, and then I had to remember like they're trying to make you give up. I, I, was, I was told that I was strong, but I also was reminded how weak I was, right? By the very people I'm supposed to be getting his love from. Um, but, good thing I didn't wear makeup. Um, but I fought and I still fight. I fight with myself, I fight with my children, I fight with society, I fight with policies, I fight with rules. Um, and I fight because I see who I am. I see a lot of conflict among a lot of our elders because so-and-so back in the day did this or didn't do this and wasn't there when I was doing this. It doesn't matter. The point is we're here now. And if our community is crying out to us for these conversations and for this type of support, we need to step up. When it's more of like the black on black conflict, it's more of like a, it's kind of like other people from the outside kind of look at us like, what are y'all arguing for? And some of us even look at each other like, what are we arguing for? We're supposed to be, like a whole. But we have a tendency to move over and make space for white people before we make space for our own in our community. And we need to learn as elders how to make space for us and not move. What's happened uh, in terms of generational change and conflict is the things that have been said about this idea of our elders historically wanting us to naturally just let them be the ones that have done it, honor that, uh, not have a voice in the process. Um, because that's how we're taught how to respect historically. What's changed is that young people are not like that anymore. And so what I think that we need to figure out how to do, and I'm, I'm still working on this myself, is how do we disagree well and then move forward with that. Giving people the opportunity to make the mistakes that we made and then still allowing them to come back and love them and show love to them without all of the harsh I told you so. Because we're used to catering to our, our white counterparts in order to just survive. And our kids don't want to survive no more. Our generations don't want to survive. They want to live and thrive. They try their best, to be honest, for one. But what they can do more of is just kind of like guide the younger people. Nobody wants to like truly communicate on helping each other. To me, I'm in the third, if it was a football game, I'm in the third quarter. And, uh, <laughs> You know, I'm, to me, I'm at 60, I feel like I'm in the third quarter. Um, so, so, yeah. <laughs> so, so I feel like I'm at, a, I'm at a stage where all I, all I need to be doing is giving and not taking. Part of that's pride. Um, and part of that is um, people don't want to be in the third quarter. You know what I mean? It's hard to, to acknowledge that you're in the third quarter. And so, so it's things like that. I've worked in the white community all my life. And I've been wanting to do something in the black community, but I've been held back by my own thoughts, you know, and some of those hurts that I have go really deep. For people who have been marginalized and oppressed before they were born and have never been able to be innocent, before the womb. Um, again, we turn it on, on ourselves before we turn it on, on the oppressor. And so I've been doing this giant rummage cell to get rid of all that stuff I don't need so I can have room for me, so I can have room for you and for you. I love you, I love you. I love you. Now this woman here, real quick, when I seen her, I hadn't seen her. I haven't seen this beautiful woman, my elder, my leader, in like 20, maybe 20 years, maybe? 20, 25 years, 15, 25 years. I haven't seen her. I've been in the same city she's been in. 
I've been in the house like she's been in the house, you know? And it's, it, it, it's, we're cheating ourselves. Because when I seen her, all I thought about instantly was how much she impacts in my life. And it brought me to tears. Why you want us to do the feedback on your employer about how they helping us in our life and we've been doing this? Stop asking for solutions to keep your family employed. Because if you were truly interested in solving this problem, why are there no black businesses in this community? Um, there's some days where I don't want to start because I just feel like I'm tired of going. I've been here for how many years? And you know, that makes you wonder and it, and it makes you question why haven't a lot of minorities evolved here? So why are our children being removed at such a high rate? Why are our children being removed and being placed into white homes and then they lose their cultural identity? How do I know? Because I'm a social worker, I'll say it again. I am dealing with African-American children who are three and 16 who are afraid of their own people. And this community, how you afraid? It ain't that many of us. Because what I see is you getting grants to have conversations with us, but I don't see no business doors opened up. You know, your doctor's white, your mayor is white, your school teachers are white. You know, your police officers are white, your boss is white. That's just the lives that most people of color live. So as a result, we get all of these examples of white people because they're at almost every junction in our lives. The old white Duluth who got the money and their intentions is to keep the money because generational wealth and legacy is theirs to claim. The difference between them and us is that we don't have no buildings. That's what it's about the chum and the other places because people want to be able to, they want to be able to control who goes and comes. But they'll act like it's all good, right? I want you here. I'm going to support you in some ways. And I'm, and I'm not saying this to say that white people are bad because that's, that's not my intent. But whiteness is a condition. It's a consciousness. It's not the color of somebody's skin. It's about who is in charge and who is not in charge. And so, like, I've always thought about, like, the biggest, the biggest weigh-in you have on life is your education. But at the same time, like, your education could be the biggest, like, thing that takes, like, knocks you down. So it's like, I stop worrying about, like, if it's, like, the Board of Education and more, like, my own knowledge. Like, so I started going more towards that. I'm intentional about texting my sons and my nephews. Real powerful stuff every day and that's because I just don't remember ever receiving that information. It's just tiring. I remember going to school trying to get all my teachers to care and they just did it and all they needed it's like one key it's just relationship that's all that there is needed. And it's small steps from programming to just doing community advocacy, making sure somebody call me in the middle of the night on a Saturday night and there's no food shelves open. We get them food. We get them a place to stay. Cause that's what we should be doing for the community. Where, where do I see my life? At the end of the day, I'll be the auntie on the block yelling down the street. That's who I'll be. I quilt. I used to say, well, I still do. I quilt so people could live. And I'm not dead yet. And so I'm going to keep on developing passions and finding out how to give to my own community. I say there are significant, tremendous mental health benefits in addition to the physical, we know the physicals, but the mental health benefits of having a connection to nature can help black people across the country. And I'm extremely passionate about that. Um, I, I write spoken words and I make music mostly, like poems and stuff like that. I'm not really the artist type, but like, I like painting. Like, even if it's just little things or like coloring, or just being alone, like no friends, just being isolated to myself. How do you, how do you, how do you try to articulate slavery, Jim Crow, civil rights era, Donald Trump, whiteness, systems of oppression, um, 
slave mentality within our own community, uh, I am a proponent of healing. I think um, my mom and my father are the old generation black people in Duluth who try to do things the right way. One of the things that is so important, that ground rule, is that you learn how to be your own best friend. That you learn how to love you. And if you, if there's not an advocate out there for you, you just look. I don't care where the teacher is, I don't care if it's the custodian or the janitor. You look for someone who can look you in the eye and tell you that you are special. Is that the brain is conditioned one of two ways. The brain cannot be in protection and growth at the same time. So if you're always in survival mode, you're in protection mode. That's the same thing. I am protecting myself. And when you're in protection mode, you are not allowing yourself to grow. Uh, I felt like if I can survive in the woods for a week by myself, I can do anything in the man-made world, don't matter what it is. Come on now. Learn who you are. And then for you to create a picture of who you will become and then go and be that person. Never lose who God created in you. We should focus on being there for people because it makes them, I know it made me feel way better and it taught me a lot also. It taught me to like be there for people and, and be their support and help advocate for them. And yeah, it works in the long run, it really does. You know, a lot of times we have these great ideas and we have these great ambitions and we have these fires, you know, in our eyes and, you know, people will come and try to snipe out that fire. They will put it out. And I've had so many instances like yourself where that fire has been put out. And I think the resolution tonight is just seeing the coming together camaraderie and the power that is here is, is lively. It's infectious. And I want this to continue to grow in my life. Caring stories, traumas, pain, hope, faith within our arms, within our eyes, within our stride, within our breath. We are those seeking healing in order to reconcile bridges burned, lives taken, birthed hate, trust broken. How could we forget? How can we forget? Elias Clayton. Elmer Jackson, Isaac McGee, for you, we are the storytellers, movement makers, a wave of justice, we are truth. I can't breathe. 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 I can't breathe.
something no one should ever say. That is a powerful documentary, and I am honored to have in the studio tonight Daniel and Sandra Oyen Loyer. At this point, who did you make this for, and what were you hoping audiences would take from it? We made it for everyone. Um, but it's always important to know that when I say everyone, there's a lot of folks who, um, who believe they're progressive, mm -hmm. who believe they are already, they're not racist, mm -hmm. who believe that they have done a lot of internal work in racism. And I wanted this to be a reminder that that's a continual process. Mm -hmm. So in terms of audiences, mm -hmm. it's for everyone. But yes. it's for everyone who continues to fight and gets exhausted to remember that it's an exhausting journey. It's been happening for longer than any of us are, have been here. Um, and that we have to confine in each other um, and let l um, black narratives lead the way. Mm -hmm. uh, because I think if black narratives and native narratives and uh, indigenous narr narratives, sorry, um, uh, lead the way and other folks who are even migrants um, in, in this society to some extent look at how the impacts of their, their presence here um, are, are, or what impacts this society is having on them, if that narrative leads the way, we could begin to, we can find strength, mm -hmm. and we can find mm -hmm. hope, uh, real hope, real confrontational hope. So the audience is everyone. Uh, but more consciously, I like to always focus on folks who are already doing the work, who I consider allies, who um, are also, I think, play a role in, in bringing more folks along. Mm -hmm. um, so just, that's the audience. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There was a point in the documentary where you had an opportunity for some of the youth to talk about who they hope to be as they grow up. Um, how was that, hearing that, those stories? Yeah, so um, with storytelling, you kind of let the story tell. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, and so it happened in set. So we, we're having all these conversations, and um, you want, we wanted to know what everyone was committed to. Yes. So to hear what the young people think of themselves in terms of the commitment, to hear a young girl mm -hmm. say, I wanted to, I want to be a homeless shelter. Yes. Mm -hmm. I wanted to do this, but I'm going to change mm -hmm. my mind because I came to Duluth and I've seen a lot of homeless folks. Mm -hmm. To hear someone say, I want to be a lawyer because I don't want to hide in the shadows. Mm -hmm. I think that to me, it's like very impactful. And I love working with youth because I feel if we could empower young people, um, if we could literally empower them, encourage them, give yes. them a, a, not just a stage, but support, protect them. Mm -hmm. um, what the future could be would be stories like Brian Stevenson's story. Mm -hmm. uh, to look at you know his family history and to be able to make a decisions to say I'm going to fight for this mm -hmm. yes. um, and aligning your heart to your mind I think that's the power of just that segment excellent tell me more about the title I can't breathe what does this mean today she wrote it <laughs> <laughs> I think Did I? yeah Sandra will tell you the best about <laughs> that um, yeah I can't breathe I it, it, it speaks volumes mm -hmm. um, the reason why we ended up naming the documentary I Can't Breathe, um, especially given the current you know, climate mm -hmm. and everything, the, the murder of George Floyd, um, is because that is really, I believe, to be the narrative of being black in this country, mm -hmm. right? I feel like s seldom black people get the opportunity to simply breathe, mm -hmm. whether it's at work, Mm -hmm. Right, whether it's in the community we, we live in, um, whether it is at school, um, whether it's when we're being you know harassed or, or brutalized by police or 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 white supremacy, um, there just hasn't been that time. And and how I I also um, see it is also healing. Mm -hmm. You yes. know, I'm a strong believer in healing, and that you know as a country, as a, as a community, um, we can't move forward without. Um, reconciliation and also healing, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I feel like the black community in this country has never truly had an opportunity to heal, yes. right? That going going into the concept of breathing, right? Because we're constantly re-traumatized, yes. right? Um, we were speaking earlier before we started and I was telling you that I hadn't watched the video, you know, because of that. We're constantly yes. re-traumatized and we haven't given a, a, a point in, in time to be able to heal because we're, we're always on, on, like, we're always doing something. We're always having to deal with something, you yes. know, whether it's poverty, right? Um, whether it is, it is another black man shot on the streets, right? Whether it's, um, you know, dealing with, with things in your, in your workplace, in your environment. 
there just hasn't been an opportunity for people to really just be and and that i think is is the the main reason um why we decided to to name it and that and why that is so important because people are tired mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know people are tired um and people want to heal mm -hmm. you yes. know um and that within itself just you know tells it all you know we we can't breathe mm -hmm. Absolutely. Thank you for that. And it really ties in the narrative of where we're at today. In 1920, June 15th, three men had their lives strangled and taken from them. Yeah. And here we are 100 years later where another white officer murdered mm -hmm. a man by stepping on his neck. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I've heard many youth tell me is the only thing that's going to survive COVID is racism. But I tell you, there's new hope. Our young people are taking to the streets. Mm -hmm. They're standing up and they're saying, no more, not here, not anywhere. Tell me how you feel about the new movement that's going on. I feel like it's always been there too, you know what I'm saying? Like mm -hmm. the young people have had enough for so long. Mm -hmm. uh, but the new movement in terms of that, we're staying in the streets. Yes. We're, we're showing up every day. Um, mm -hmm. It's out of what my wife, I think, had talked about, which is that tiredness, yes. is the kids go to school. In school, they can't breathe. Yes. There is an officer in school sometimes that are getting information from kids who have probation on them. Mm -hmm. They can't breathe. There is no space for them to recollect their thought, to be given chance to be like, okay, make a few mistakes. Th let's figure out how we could help you for real. So this is an era where young people are saying, we do not want just a little bit. We do not want what our fathers and our forefathers had to be given because that was the little they could be get to get out of a tougher situation that they were in. We are at a place where young people are asking, saying, we want freedom. We want, we want, what, we want to be recognized as full human beings. And mm -hmm. that to me is what's really loud in the streets, is with everything going on, I've seen young people show up to the protest, not even show up, lead the protest, lead the protest. show up to the protest, clean up after the protest, mm -hmm. help organize the new protest, mm -hmm. and that is not being told. Mm -hmm. What is being told is young people showing up, causing riots, breaking property. And we have a, a long history in America that, that, that values property over black bodies mm -hmm. uh, because for slavery to occur in America, we all know that the only way that could happen was to reduce black bodies to less than properties mm -hmm. and create a trans transactional system for them. But years later, we still have candidates like Mr. Trump using this idea of that properties are more important than human bodies mm -hmm. as a rhetoric for political gain. Mm -hmm. So I think young people are showing up now saying, no, we are full people. We're not going to be bamboozled by your ideologies. We are going to take care of each other. We're going to fight for each other. We're going to stand up for each other. We're going to call this out. Um, that's, that's someone's father who just died, mm -hmm. Judge Floyd. Yes. That girl is going to grow up without a father, mm -hmm. with a family and a community, yes, but without a father. Mm -hmm. and yes. That's why kids can can't do that anymore. That's too much trauma. Mm -hmm. So the movement of today is not just burdened by just movement. It's not, it's not hearsay. It's not just a word. It's not just a movement of walking in the streets to cause riots. It's saying we literally are dying mm -hmm. and we can't take it anymore. Mm -hmm. This is our life. This is our story. We, we need something else. If not, you are killing the last of us. Yes, yeah, we won't. I, we won't take it anymore. And, and I and I kind of I just want to add to that too. You know the the concept of um, you know having having a young uh, a young person out mm -hmm. you know growing up without a father, right? You know we're having this conversation because of the death of of black people in this country, right? Yes. And the thing about it, you know, when we think of modern day lynching, mm -hmm. right? Um, it's not just the deaths, right? We, we have to consider mass incarceration too, mm -hmm. right? And, and the amount of black bodies, right, that are sitting in prisons, right? Um, basically sitting in, in slavery, yes. right? Um, that are sitting, sitting behind bars and, and the, the constant destruction, right, of, of black families, of ba black youth, mm -hmm. right, that are growing up without, without, um, rel without relatives that could be you know, by them because of the system of white supremacy, mm -hmm. and um, and you know, going to jail for think for petty crimes and and just you know, some going to jail for no crimes at all sometimes, mm -hmm. you know, but the color of, of your skin um, is is interesting. And then 
just you know your question about the young the young folks and and mm -hmm. and the movement you know like just makes me think of the black lives matter yes right um and i think that if we hadn't named this documentary i can't breathe i would have also been okay with black lives matter because it it, it it makes me think of where we are and kind of how the movement has evolved over mm -hmm. time. You know, from black power, mm -hmm. you know, this affirmation that like, I'm we're black, powerful. I'm beautiful, and I, I'm powerful. I'm a yes. powerful individual, right? We're, we're moving, we, we've seen the, the shifts in, in the different generations, right? To now where we're at, black lives matter. You know, to me says, um, says a lot because mm -hmm. We're, we're seeing, we're at this point where all I really want you to know is that I matter. Yes. Right? All I really want you to know is that um, there's things going on with me, mm -hmm. right? And you need to pay attention, <laughs> right? And, and it, it, it just saddens me that a lot of people take it and they're like, oh, you know, all lives matter, right? Mm -hmm. And it's like, because black lives matter does not mean that all lives do not matter. Right. right? Um, when we say save the rainforest, we're not saying like, you know, all the other rainforests should just burn and, and we don't really need them, right? right? We're saying that this is something that needs our attention right now, right? Mm -hmm. Because um, because we haven't paid attention, yes. right? Because we've potentially neglected this space, right? So it's, um, that's just what I think about when I think of the movement as far as Black Lives Matter and um, just, you know, that, that call for like, yo, I'm here, That's right. right? I exist mm -hmm. and, and I deserve to, to be here too, right? Um, I, I believe that's where all, that, all the frustration um, in the younger generation comes from. And yes, we've moved forward and yes, we've, we've, um, we've, made changes in our systems, but those changes are not sufficient, right? right? Because we've found um, institutionalized ways to still continue mm -hmm. um, the, the previous systems, right? And a lot of people are calling for that to end, right? Yes. Um, yeah. So, 2020, where do we go from here as a black community? I mean, I have many ideas, um, but I'm just one. <laughs> I'm just one man. Um, as a storyteller, the first thing I, 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 I run to is we have to think of ourselves as a space that needs to, to heal. And I think individually as black people, we need to confront our, ourselves in that way. Mm -hmm. um, I say that because as a black man living in America, mm -hmm. um, before I turned 25, I was assaulted here in Duluth by the poli um, pol um, Duluth PD. Um, I was pepper sprayed and put in a jail cell. And I remember sitting there and thinking, um, there was a statistics I wrote, I, I read that said that before I turned 25, I would be in the jail. No. And I read it as a, it's funny because when I read it, I'm like, yeah. Mm -hmm. But when that happened to me, it felt so surreal. Yeah. And to me, I feel like as, a, as black people, we need to reflect on ourselves as spaces that need to heal and, and take what we need to heal in the best possible way. What I mean by that is, shortly after that incident, I quit my job yes. because I needed my mental health to be okay. I needed to convince myself that I don't need to perpetrate this habit that I have to keep hustling, I have to keep hustling, I have to work and survive and survive and survive and survive. So I had to take some time for myself. Yes, it was hard. I had to survive on $20 a month. It was difficult, which nobody should have to, which is something that systematically we have to talk about when we talk about the bigger healing, right. what it really takes for people to take a break and to, to find, mm -hmm. to begin to confront things, those are certain things. So as black buddies in America, that's mm -hmm. one way is begin to focus on ourselves as taking back our power. We can't overexhaust ourselves. Yes. We have to pace ourselves. And for the black community as a whole in the world, I also think mm -hmm. I have a message for that because in Africa, I grew up in, as a Nigerian kid. Mm -hmm. A Nigerian kid who never had the opportunity to confront what colonialism meant to him in Nigeria mm -hmm. because we were colonized by the British. Yes. I feel like most Africans haven't had the time to confront colonialism in Africa. We've just been reacting since the 1960, I believe, since we got our independence about 60 some years ago. We're just reacting to the colonial uh, power system. We have a broken political system and we, nobody could confront it because we don't even know who's running it. Yes. If it's Nigerians or other folks, you know what I'm saying? Like that's, that's the issue is it's so deep 
that we as black people around the world need to begin to reflect and see how connected we are, how one we are. Yes. And then with, be, when we start putting our energy to recoup energy, there's nothing we cannot do. We're, we're starting to see some of that connectedness as uh, mm -hmm. the death, unfortunately, of George Floyd has mm -hmm. sparked a movement across the world. Absolutely. And we're seeing that now. And you spoke about trauma, and trauma is something that is very real that you pull out in the documentary. As I sat and listened, I was moved by how many, almost all of the folks on that film has been through some type of trauma. Mm -hmm. Yep. Right? Mm -hmm. And how are we as a community able to deal and work with trauma and understand that sometimes our kids are reacting to trauma. They're not bad kids, right? Sometimes they make bad decisions, but some of that is trauma. Mm -hmm. And as an adult male, I know myself, dealing with some of the micro inequities of a day to day, sometimes what walks in that door at the end of the day yeah. is trauma. That's real. So are we creating spaces? Are we creating that opportunity mm -hmm for our kids to find ways to deal with trauma. Within the black community, the, the only thing I feel is, I feel like we've taxed ourselves so much. Mm -hmm. And that's why I really like the, the name of this documentary is I Can't Breathe. So I hate to task more black folks to do stuff. You know yes. what I'm saying? Like, that's how I feel. Like, if, if I had a chance, I would mm -hmm. give more breaks to my people. Mm -hmm. um, if I had monies, I would give monies to people to take a break. Yes. Um, that's, I think, is paramount. And that helps the trauma. And when it comes to regenerative education, when it comes to resource, like teaching folks, um, um, I think we do have a role to play. Tell the stories to the younger generation. I think our elders, the black elders, need mm -hmm. to, um, to, to step up to that mm -hmm. and focus on storytelling to the younger generation and let the younger generation lead the way. Um, and I think that the younger generation, as they lead the way, also have to continue to figure out and ask questions and see what, what is necessary, what's needed, what kind of wisdom they need to be able to move forward as mm -hmm. well. So mm -hmm. when it comes to trauma, that's how I feel about it. Uh, and that's important that we start to create a space here mm -hmm. in Duluth. Right now there's no space mm -hmm. for African heritage people to go to have that trauma even recognized, Absolutely. let alone mm -hmm. a place where we can heal and come together and build strong community and strong and healthy kids and families. Mm -hmm. Yes. Ultimately, oh, I'm sorry. No, please. Ultimately, you know, when we talk about trauma, and I, I mean, I, I echo this um, often, um, we can't even start to heal from our trauma, right? Because I was talking about how we, we haven't had an opportunity to breathe, we haven't had an, op had an opportunity to, um, to heal because it's literally like we're bleeding, yes. right? Imagine all three of us are sitting here bleeding, mm -hmm. right? And as I'm bleeding, you're bleeding. I come over and I'm like, oh my goodness, you're bleeding way more than I am. I need to go over there and, and patch you up and, and yes. bandage you and that, that's healing for you, right? Mm -hmm. Now, while I'm doing that, I'm still bleeding, yes. right? And once I think that that situation is somewhat under control, I might start, you know, putting the band-aids on myself. And then halfway through my band-aids, Daniel's bleeding, right? So now I'm over there, I'm, I'm helping him. Halfway through that, you're bleeding again. You know what I mean? And that's the, the state of where the healing, I think, for black people has been. And we can't heal, mm -hmm. right, until perpetrators figure out what's going on with them and, put, and heal themselves, mm -hmm. right? Yes. Oftentimes when we talk about healing, we're talking about um, victims, right? Mm -hmm. The victim mm -hmm. is bleeding, we need to go over there, right? But if I leave you and I go over there and the perpetrator comes and does it again, yes. right? We're constantly in a circle, we're constantly in a loop, right? So when I think of where we go next, it is important for people mm -hmm. to heal all around. Mm -hmm. Right? Um, oftentimes when I think of white supremacy and I think of folks who are racist, right, mm -hmm. and, and just like, oh, just believe in this ideology. Um, the thought of, I, I understand it, mm -hmm. because it's, it's an easy way, it's mm -hmm. an easy route. Yeah. Um, it is a, an, an easy way to say, I'm not going to deal with this, because confronting this, right, confronting what's going on in the world, confronting what's happening in these communities, confronting racism is hard work, mm -hmm. right? It's not something that we just get over like this, right? right? So it's easy for me to cop out and be like, 
well, it's because white folks are superior, so now I don't have to do the work, mm -hmm. right? And this is the way things should be because, mm -hmm. um, because this is just how it's supposed to be, right? right? I think it's an easy cop out, and I think that's what a lot of people in this country do because they don't want to have that uncomfortable conversation. Um, and until they start having those conversations in their homes and their workplaces, yes. in their communities, like we can't move forward, okay. right? Because no matter what we do as a community, we will still be brutalized by those perpetrators, right? Okay. Um, and you know, and that just brings me to like you know, us conversations amongst ourselves about you know we just need to get this or white people saying things like oh you know black folks should just work harder mm. and pull themselves up from the oh. first of all we built the shoe mm. just want to put that out there that's right <laughs> <laughs> we built the shoe mm -hmm. <laughs> and um well, you this know is, this is true this and is true. and even after that you know every other time that we've tried to say okay you know what we're going to do this work we're 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 met with with anger mm -hmm. by them you know like even when you think of black wall street right mm -hmm. yes. it's hard for us to build black wealth in this country mm -hmm. right it's hard for us to do a lot of things in this mm -hmm. country um it's hard for us to be it's hard for us to breathe you know yes. and i keep coming back to that because i just feel like that is really like the, the phrase the core of of it all right mm -hmm is that healing all around needs to happen and and those deeper conversations need to need to take place and there is no space and time for it every time Absolutely. every space is is an opportunity for that conversation can i add on to what Please. you had mentioned um in terms of the black community and the whole community like my wife has mentioned too of like the healing process of all i think what what you were trying to bring up carl Mm -hmm. um, as a very core action point, especially in the Duluth space, is space. Yes. Is that Duluth does not have space for, we don't have space as a black community. Yeah. Um, and even with even the, the indigenous community here barely mm -hmm. has space as well. Um, yes. So what I'm saying here is that, like you said, practical things can be done in the larger picture mm -hmm. to help facilitate spaces or to mm -hmm. give spaces uh, to, this, to, to our communities. I want to thank our guests for joining me for our special presentation of I Can't Breathe, the Clayton Jackson McGee Memorial. WDSE WRPT is a producing a series of special Almanac North episodes this summer titled Focus on Systemic Racism. To continue these conversations, if you have additional ideas or topics that you'd like to see covered in this special series, please reach out to -E WDSEORG or connect with us on social media. You'll find us on Facebook and YouTube. You can watch this and other Almanac North programs at WDSE.org or on the PBS app. For our crew in the studio, I'm Carl Crawford and thanks for watching.